Hi, my name is James Little, and I wanted to share with you today a series of talks. We'll start with the series one, the first part of the series, but the whole series will concern the LC mass spec unknown identifications using MSMS -MS libraries, and in particular, the NIST MSMS -MS libraries and their associated software suite that allows one to identify unknowns. We've used this approach for many years at Eastman, and I wanted to share with others because I feel like it's a little underutilized compared to the EI methods for identifying things using the NIST search. And I have already created a webinar series with that, talking about that aspect of the software. So I wanted to repeat the same concepts, but this time discussing the MSMS libraries. Our series would be broken down into eight sections that I've listed here. The first one will be the overview, but then we'll talk about the search in part two, more detailed discussion in three of the hybrid search, which I'm particularly excited about for EI and tandem library searches. We we'll talk about importing MSMS spectrum from your different uh, software, such as uh, Thermo or Waters or Agilent. NIST structure searches, you can search the database by structures for MSMS spectrum. MS interpreter is able, enables one to correlate the fragments in a spectrum to the ions in the spectrum, very valuable. And we'll talk about using creating your other MSMS -MS libraries and such as using maybe Wiley or using the Mona databases or creating your own. And then finally talk about identification of unknowns with spectralist databases. I must point out that this is just will be an overview that we have on the video YouTube part of it. The most useful information will be found in the handouts. And you can find that on my website at the location here, HTTPS, little MS and sailing at wordpress.com, wordpress.com. So take a look at the handouts, but uh, to get you started, just give you an overview, we'll talk about uh, just the windows themselves and how you configure the NIST software. So let's go to the software here. You can see that we have the, the main window of the NIST 2.4 software that came out in 2020. Always up here, this is the spec list. This is where you bring in your unknowns for processing. So this one's been imported, I think, from an Agilent software package. And we'll search that in a second and show what the results are. And when you do search it, you can just select it and say go. That's one way you can. Or you can double left click on it if you want to. Just double left click on it. You'll see at the bottom we have the results sorted by the best result on the top. And you can step through it with the arrows on your keyboard to look at them. And as you step through, you'll see the windows in the right, you always have your unknown at the top, some information about the unknown that was brought in with the spectrum from the outside software. You'll have a mirror image with the unknown on top and the known that it finds the best match on the bottom. And then you'll have a spectrum and the information that go with the best unknown. And as you step through those, you'll see them change. You'll see that I'm just stepping through with the arrow keys on the keyboard and you can kind of compare them visually, which is very important. and. The best hits will be close to a thousand. This is just a simple pattern search of the library. We'll do two other types in later videos, but you can see we got a match for about 893 out of a thousand, which is good. Uh, the matches for MSMS -MS will be a little bit lower than the EI in general, but uh, you can see we did find a good fit. This is actually from an instrument and this is from the NIST library here, the best hit. And you can see they match relatively well considering that one was from two different MSMS -MS instruments. And in general, the MSMS -MS spectra will not match as well as the EI because of the variation in tandem spectra with energy. But anyway, you can find very useful results in identifying unknowns. So that's pretty much the gist of the whole concept of doing this. But let's, let's talk a little bit more about the windows. The NIST interface is all about settings. When you first get it out of the package, you probably want to have it the way you want. So you need to make it like you want it. So you can push things around, like you can grab the thing here and compress a little bit. Uh, this usually shows the histogram of the searches. I don't find that very useful, but I do find it very useful to know what libraries were searched and how many spectral were searched just to make sure I'm doing what I want to do. I'm searching the three NIST commercial libraries here. So I push that up just to get save a little real estate here. At the bottom or over here on the right, we've got all these mass to charge intensities I don't find that very useful. So any window, let me stress that any window, you can right click on it and go to properties by scrolling down. I right mouse clicked on it first, properties, and you can get rid of things you don't want. So let's get rid of the mass to charge intensity list. That's not very useful in my opinion. So I made that go away. 
And now we've saved a little space here. The other thing is down at the bottom, you can see a lot of things roll off to the side that you don't see without having to scroll. Uh, so I like to go right click properties there and come down and say wrap text. And that allows everything to appear on the page. Things that are now off the page wrap back so you can see them on the page here. So now they're uh, not rolling off the edge of the page. So that's better. So we've got that. And so after you do that, the first thing you want to do is to say file, save configuration. And after you get things the way you want them, you just say it, uh, I'm just gonna call this one mine and save it. So now anytime you get on your computer and you want to do a certain thing, you just come up and say file, restore configuration. And the, the ones that are most actively used are here, but you can go and say restore configuration. It'll look on your disk drive for all of them that you've saved. But this case, all you do is just say mine and we'll say, we don't wanna save the current one, we wanna restore mine. And you're back to where you were when you saved the configuration. So again, uh, the other thing you can do, these all of these windows for the Spectra can be zoomed and magnified if you want to, just like you are in your own database program when you're looking at Spectra in your processing software and we'll zoom back out, but you can move the Spectra around to look like you want. So that's one thing you might want to do to set up. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of the other windows. Of course, let's mention again, this is where our unknowns are. These are where our results are. These are the unknown spectrum here. This is the mirror image of the unknown on the top, the known on the bottom, whichever one you have selected in the window over here, and then the information. There are other tabs at the bottom, and you can go to other search, and other search allows you to search by a lot of different things, such as, uh, exact mass formula, et cetera. The one I find most use, useful, and we won't go through it in detail today, but you ought to play with this if you're looking for things. You can do a sequential method where you pick the database that you want to search. We'll talk about which ones are the best later. And then you can do constraints of anything. And you can actually sum these constraints. So you could do more than one. You could do a name fragment for a partial name. You could tell it how many elements it had and then just say search. And so that can be very valuable when you're looking for things. So Keep in mind doing sequential searches. And I didn't talk about that a lot in the handouts, but that could be very valuable. Names, uh, you can look for names. Like if you wanted to look for something in the high resolution MSMS library, we wanted to look for, let's say aspirin. You'll see that it has all the spectra for aspirin here you want. And you can scroll up and see more, I think. Yes, there are a bunch of them at different energies. The problem with MSMS in general is if depending on the energy, you get a different spectrum and EI, not so much the case, everything at 70 electron volts is very, very similar. Uh, so it's very reproducible. So here you have to have a lot of different spectra. So when you search the library, you'll get the right result or the one that matches yours particular energy level. So they have a lot of different energy levels and you can sort by using A to Z. Uh, that allows you to just put in uh, the like letters here. Uh, when you take that off, it'll actually let you use the numbers. Like if you want to use one, uh, one hydroxy naphthalene or something, it would use the number too. So AZ just means it'll only, when you type in numbers, it just somewhat ignores them and puts in the letters instead. So that's that. Uh, compare is a place that you can put spectra in. You can uh, copy spectra from your results if you want to compare them. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about structure searches, how to arrange this window to make it most useful. But today we'll skip that because we'll, we'll discuss that later. Uh, the librarian, much the same. You can, we will talk about that later because that's a very detailed section that's used for a lot of different aspects of the software. But in general, this is where you correlate a spectrum with a structure that you import from your drawing program, which we'll talk about later. And then you merge them together such that you can bring them together for searching for the structure. And also you can create your own user libraries at this point too, after you've got all this information in. So we'll, we will talk about that later. So we'll skip that for right now. Over here in the results, there's one very useful thing about the NIST software. You can sort by different things. The match is how, it, how well it matches based on a thousand. The reverse match is such that when you have unknown ions in your spectrum up here that don't show up in the reference, then they're not penalized in the score. So you can sort things by reverse match as opposed to match, which is, does, is penalized for ions that are present in here 
that are present here. But the nice thing that I'm really trying to point out here is all these columns can be sorted just by clicking on them uh, pretty much like you would do in Excel. So anything can be clicked, but usually it will come up initially the way the searches are set up is match. Uh, the icons up here are somewhat interesting. The go button uh, tells it when you have a spectrum here to, to do the, the library search. You can also double left click on that. That's another way to do the library search. You can go up and say search and do the library search if you want to. Uh, but usually I just double left click. I find that a little quicker. But initially, and you'll notice here when you put, when you hover over something momentarily, you'll actually see the function of it. So that's one part of the help. Uh, it has a lot of helpful features in here. You can tell what search you did. We did a simple peak matching search. It uh, found uh, 52 spectra in the default search part of the library search. If you look at the bottom, it'll tell you the type of search you did, which was a simple uh, search to tell you the pattern. That's which one will be searched next here. The displayed simple tells you which one you just did. So if you didn't know uh, which one you just did, what type of search, there's three different types of searches that we will talk about, uh, but this will tell you what you just did. This will tell you what you'll be doing the next time you click the go button if you change something. So that's the go button. This little thing that looks like a structure is the structure search. And we'll talk about that in depth in a later session. This is very important. This is the library search options. And that's a very detail, detailed topic that we'll talk about in setting up for, for library searches when we talk about li library searches. But if you click on that, it carries you into a group of menus. And to do the search properly, you have to set all of these up to have the right parameters to do the search correctly. I've already got this set up for doing similarity type searches where I'm just finding things that look alike. But after you get that, of course, you want to go and say file and save the configuration. And I have three different configurations. I have one for uh, direct peak matching like we did. We have one for the hybrid search. And I also have one for another similarity using a precursor ion. So those are the three type searches, but I have three different configurations saved for doing that for easy recall when I want to switch between them. So that's a very one, this is critical here. Uh, the history here tells you what you've done in the past searches. You can bring back one without having to search again, just by bringing it down. You can clear the history if you want to. If you get too many things in there, I just cleared it up. This one next to it here is not applicable in MSMS in particular, but this one is best matching only. If you look at the bottom display, after you do, this is performed after you do the search. You can click on this and say, only show the things that have the best match that have the same CAS number. So this just simplifies the thing. And all of a sudden you'll see that your list been greatly simplified and only kept one for this compound that has appear. So all the other ones that were duplicates that had the same CAS number go away. So it makes it a little easier to look at the results of the search because you only look at one before sticking, stepping down to the next best possibility. So I find that very handy. This one, this little icon here just tells you, uh, oh, that's not the right one, I'm sorry. This one here shows you what you actually did if you want more information about what you did at your search. So it tells you some information that you would see at the bottom and the top of your screen and in this intermediate layer here, this little thin band that I made go away for the histogram, that's really duplicated in this, this window here. So it's just additional information. This one is somewhat interesting here. This again is applied after the search, just like this CAS. It, you, so you can just make it resource your search results by turning off filtering. So I can show things that only have an M plus H, uh, things that came from a particular type of instrument. So you can sort your results. Usually it's safer when you do your searches initially, just turn that off because all of a sudden you might not get any results because you had these filters set wrong. So I usually turn that off to do my search. I usually turn off the CAS initially when I do the search. I don't want it to filter anything before I do the search. And then, like I said, those can be applied without having to research. This can and this can after to simplify your result. So make use of that to make better results. There's a couple of other things you'll notice here at the bottom 
you can see that for the accurate mass data, it tries to put the molecular formula and the accurate mass, which is somewhat nice, but it gets a little complicated to me. So I usually like just to see the accurate mass initially. So you go to properties and you can turn off this little formula YB and we keep the mass to charge label because I like that and say, okay. And that'll simplify your results a little bit, but you can turn that on if you like it. So let's see if there's any other things that we don't, uh, that we need to cover. I, well, there's one thing, like if you right click on and go to properties, always remember any window you can click on and go to properties. And when you do that, you can bring up the window and change anything. And you can see all of the things you can change, all of these different tabs you could click on and set up uh, even colors if you wanted to. And, but what I find very helpful is the help here. So you can click on help here and it brings up the part of the help menu that's built into the software that tells you what you would be interested in setting up in that window. So every window that you bring down will have this help. Uh, so pay attention to that. And if you need additional information, uh, take a look there. You'll also, as I mentioned before, all of the things that I covered today are found in my handout on my website in detail with screenshots. Uh, like this is an example here, I have them all here. And it starts with a table of contents that makes it a little easier to find things. So there's 22 slides in here that essentially talk about everything that we've talked about in this video. So take a look at that. And I hope this has been helpful and I hope you attend some of the other sessions. There's seven more that cover other topics, as I mentioned before, as we show here. So join me for those and we will be seeing you later, I hope.